As I greet you once again this morning, I am reminded that it is exactly two weeks to Christmas Day, a day decided upon and set apart to celebrate the birth of Jesus. <clears throat> this particular date was chosen not because it was actually the birth date of Jesus, but because it coincided with another celebration popular at the time. So that those who called themselves Christians could celebrate without sticking out like a sore thumb. <clears throat> However, that other day of celebration coincided, as we have noticed before, <clears throat> with the period of the winter solstice. There was a recognition of something of the relatedness which the function of human beings on earth has to larger cosmic events. <clears throat> In this instance, the passage around the sun of the earth in its annual orbit. So inadvertently, there was an acknowledgement on the part of Christians <clears throat> of participation in cosmic events with respect to the one who they have claimed as their savior. <clears throat> of course, according to the record, he himself emphasize the reality of one to whom he referred as the Father, <clears throat> which would indicate <clears throat> relatedness to the larger pattern of things. The planet Earth is not an isolated speck of dust. Spinning by chance. <clears throat> in its orbit around a rather mediocre star. <clears throat> in our earthly consciousness, <clears throat> We are made aware through our physical senses of a rather limited range of substance present with us close at hand and also apparently 
spread around throughout the whole universe. This substance is largely discernible because it reflects electromagnetic radiation of a certain wavelength. That reflection we call light. <clears throat> Out of the total range of electromagnetic radiation, what is perceptible to us as light is a very small portion. <clears throat> Therefore, what we can perceive on the basis of sight <clears throat> with respect to what we call substance <clears throat> is small. This is one of the reasons why it seems as though the universe is full of empty space. Because very little of the substance that is actually present throughout the whole universe reflects light that we can see. <clears throat> In recent decades, Human beings have come again to recognize that there is far more substance present in the universe than was first recognized. <clears throat> we had the opportunity of viewing some slides yesterday evening of various designs of substance, both in the solar system and beyond in the universe. When the narrow range of visible light was expanded to include the ultraviolet part of the spectrum and the x-radiation part of the spectrum, it became possible to observe a vastly increased amount of substance. Of course, in order to make it seem comprehensible, To the limited state of our earthly consciousness, it had to be colored. So that it might be interpreted on the basis of what we think we already know. <clears throat> the point I'm making, however, is the fact that there is an increasing amount of substance made recognizable when the reflection of electromagnetic radiation extends beyond what is seen by the eye as light. <clears throat> if the whole range of electromagnetic radiation was made perceptible 
by reason of its reflection, <clears throat> it would be found that the whole universe is full of substance. As human beings, we think there isn't much there. <clears throat> when we look out into the night sky, for instance, because all we see is a reflection from a certain level of substance. Little pinpoints. We have been informed, of course, that those pinpoints are sometimes of considerable size, but it doesn't seem so relative to the whole range of universal blankness. Yet it isn't blank. It's full of substance. Even if we bring it down to the solar system, there is an inclination to think of this as being mostly space. There's a lot of space to be covered, apparently, if we happen to go on a trip to Mars. <clears throat> but as was noted yesterday evening, the so-called corona of the sun includes the whole planetary system. <clears throat> and the planets are, in fact, a part of the sun. <clears throat> They're not isolated objects floating around in space. They are embedded in the substance of the solar entity. <clears throat> when we look at the sun, and it is wise to look away quickly if we do so, <clears throat> we observe a flaming object in the sky very bright, and also radiating warmth, <clears throat> which we are able to sense. We feel uncomfortable if there's too much of it, and uncomfortable if there's too little of it. But we see the sun as a separate object. The earth is here, the sun's over there. 93 million miles away. With apparently nothing in between. Of course, we are informed that there are magnetic fields, solar winds, showers of particles, all this. We may observe something of the effect in the northern lights, for instance. But we are still rather convinced that there's a great abyss between the earth and the sun. <clears throat> also between the earth and the other planets. And yet when the reflection of other ranges in the electromagnetic spectrum is made apparent to us, we find that the sun extends out a long way. And there is quite a bit of stuff around the earth. But even what is observed on the basis of the limited reflection seen from ultraviolet light, for instance, does not inform us of all the other levels of substance that are actually present. Perhaps it is rather fortunate that in earthly consciousness we do not have the facilities for perceiving the reflection of radiation 
from the total range of substance. It would likely be very confusing to us. All we see is a very little bit minute, relatively speaking. The substance that reflects what we call visible light. <clears throat> The vast majority of the radiation is not visible light. The vast majority of the substance that is present all around us is not seen at all. To all intents and purposes, human beings in general have no awareness that is present at all. Sometimes there is a perception of peculiar phenomenon, phenomena which do not seem to be included in the normal range of human observation. We have all sorts of stories about these phenomena, some of them are supposed to be somehow supernatural, <clears throat> some of them presumably explained in scientific terms, <clears throat> most people don't look too closely at these things because they're a little scary. <clears throat> But actually, we live in the midst of all the substance there is, whether we are aware of it or not. If we do become aware of something more, then we are keenly conscious of our own ignorance. Most people don't like the idea of being ignorant, so they try to limit their awareness of things to what is immediately perceptible through the physical senses and ignore all the rest. Under the human circumstance, perhaps that is wise. <clears throat> but it doesn't lead to very intelligent function in our momentary living, because we ignore 99.999% of all that is present, and we try to function upon the very on the basis of the very little bit left capable of our observation. And as the whole range of substance is not separate, it's all one thing, just different vibratory levels of this one thing. If we try to manipulate the substance that we do perceive, as though we could successfully govern our experience on this basis, <clears throat> we will at the same time be stirring up all kinds of storms and vortexes in the substance that we don't see. And these will be reflected back in the substance that we do see. And so matter, no matter how carefully we govern our actions with respect to what we do see, we find very shortly that everything is out from under control. <clears throat> because we never took into account all the substance that we don't see. Now, of course, on the basis of the true design of things, it is not the intent that human experience should be governed merely by manipulating what is visible. We have come to recognize that there is a level of understanding available which makes possible right function with 
dangerous back to the whole range of substance that may be present. But the means by which this may occur is not the human intellect. Because the human intellect functions, in its present configuration at least, on the basis of what is observable. What we call the environment. On the basis of the substance that is perceptible in that environment. The perception of some people goes a little further than others in this regard. But regardless of how far it goes from the standpoint of the earthly state of consciousness, it's not very far. And the vast majority of what is present is utterly ignored. That is the reason for ignorance. The whole universe is filled with substance. And all substance is one substance, so whatever occurs in one part of that substance will affect all other parts of that substance. Now how important it is that we as human beings should discover how to live in the midst of all this substance without injecting into it extraneous currents of action. Action that doesn't belong. Action that is based merely in the observation of the limited range of substance of which we as human beings are aware. It's interesting to note how expertly human beings rationalize what they do. Actually, of course, there is something moving through the substance of the universe which extends creative control at all levels. Insofar as this little planet is concerned, which after all isn't merely a little planet <clears throat> because it is an essential part of the whole solar entity which in turn is an essential part of the whole galactic entity which in turn is an essential part of whatever it is the system of galaxies and beyond that again however far you would like to go The earth that we know is a little range of substance under our feet a part of a far larger range of substance that occupies the whole space of the solar entity. <clears throat> at the core of which is what we call the sun. But nobody ever saw the sun, as was mentioned last evening. It has a garment about it. A garment down to the foot. <clears throat> there is a face 
which may be said to shine as the sun, <clears throat> an observable face, an observable garment. The garment, of course, includes the earth and extends beyond into the outermost reaches of the solar system. If we to took the total quantity of substance that there is present relative to this little piece of substance that we are aware and call the planet Earth, we would find that it extended a long way beyond that speck of dust. Mention was made that Uranus and Neptune are quite small planets, actually, insofar as physical substance is concerned in the ordinary sense, but they are encased in an immense amount of ice, which makes them very big planets. Perhaps that illustrates something of what the Earth itself is, only it is nice in this instance. It is vibrational substance of other levels which extends way out. And even when it extends way out, it's all included in the sun substance, which fills the whole face of the solar entity. I suppose you could say in that sense a solid substance everywhere. <clears throat> we live in quite a world. Ignorant, for the most part, of it. We just stumble around upon the surface of this visible substance, which we call the Earth, <clears throat> aware that there is fluid substance also and gaseous substance. Besides what are now called electromagnetic fields, beyond that again. But here is a whole range of substance. And the recurrence of life moving through it. Human beings are always looking for the origination of life. The amoeba must be it. But the substance of this solar entity is the flash of life. Here is a living entity included in a far vaster living entity. <clears throat> there is no substance in which life is not. These currents of life move through the substance to give it form and meaning. <clears throat> How utterly futile to try to understand the meaning of the universe by simply observing what comes within the range of the reflected radiation of which human beings are aware. Obviously, the vast majority of what is present, human beings have no awareness of. You can't take a little bit, find out what the meaning of the whole is. <clears throat> it's a futile endeavor. Stumbling around in the dark. <clears throat> The darkness comprehends not the light. I am 
mentioning all this this morning, partly so as to impress all concerned with their ignorance. <laughs> Perhaps in, for those of you who were here present yesterday evening, to hear what Hugh had to say and to observe the slides. There was a sense of the insignificance, not only of puny human beings, but even of this fellow entity. And yet, the sense of the essential nature of each part. When we become aware of such things, there is properly a, a compulsion to repent in dust and ashes. For having given ourselves so much self-importance. And how... human affairs become when seen in the setting. Hardly discernible. <clears throat> the affairs of the human race, hardly discernible. What then about the affairs of the individuals who compose the human race? Why do we give such importance to human affairs, our own individual, personal human affairs, affairs in particular. It's crazy. It's completely irrational. <clears throat> now, as I say, human beings are able to rationalize almost anything, failing to realize that what they do is in reaction to this current of life that moves through the substance that is everywhere present. Because human beings are composed of substance, not only physical substance, all the rest of the substance too. <clears throat> they find life present and moving, impelling in various ways. People do things and then explain why they do them. Usually the thought is that we have considered the matter ahead of time and so we do this. And it's a very rational action. That isn't the way it really works. We do what we do on the basis of being impelled by life, but also on the basis of the reaction of our earthly consciousness to that. And it's a very distorted reaction. So we do very irrational things. Irrational things which we attempt to explain rationally as resulting from our emotions and our intellect. Well, emotions and intellect are involved, all right. <clears throat> I was thinking of an example, rather a usual example, apparently, this time of the year, when the postal workers <laughs> go on strike. It's becoming sort of a habit. And regardless of the intention not to do so, it happens. So it has to be explained. And very rational explanations are put forward. Some people were suspended. They shouldn't have been suspended. This is the rational, mental explanation of why this phenomenon appears. Why well, have nothing to do with it? <clears throat> Whatsoever. 
It is a reaction of human beings in particular ways according to the patterns in which they find themselves to what is moving through this living substance. As chaos, increasing chaos, because there is an intensification of the movement of life. Of course, there's a reason for this too. Not a reason that human beings could fathom, but they merely are aware, indirectly at least, that it is happening. <clears throat> and so we find a condition of anarchy increasing. There are even those who suggest that anarchy should be an article of faith. The anarchists. <clears throat> And there are all kinds of different areas with which human beings align themselves, completely ignorant of the fact that what is happening is happening because of the intensifying compulsion of life moving through this total spectrum of substance. The human experience had got off on its own in an isolated pattern of attempted function as though human beings didn't really belong in the universe. As though they could somehow stand apart from the universe and observe it, <clears throat> and decide what it was all about. That's like the eye trying to look at itself. <clears throat> of movement through the total spectrum of substance present. The substance which is present here in this particular corner of the total universe embodies a certain specific expression of life. There is immense detail, obviously, in the universe. Immense detail in this solar entity. And these details are unique to themselves. even though they fit harmoniously in the whole. <clears throat> Human function has been largely in violation of the movement of life through this substance. Violation which has been established because it was imagined that the intellect of man could control the earth, this little planet, earth, while ignoring the, the substance of the greater entity, <clears throat> and such endeavors, pushing and pulling and manipulating in the world has caused this chaos which human beings call civilization. An interesting rationalization. <clears throat> the fact of the matter is that it is meaningless chaos. Going nowhere. Of course, the theory of evolution had to be invented in order to make ignorant human beings imagine that they really were going somewhere. <clears throat> well, I suppose they were going somewhere, but 
the somewhere when they reached it was found to be nowhere. That is what is called death. That's where we're all heading, isn't it? We don't like to think of it too much. But all this experience is consequent upon the fact that human beings have been isolating themselves from the real movement of life, trying to make life serve them. The way this is supposed to happen is by manipulating that very minute range of substance of which they are aware. And as I say, any such manipulation is going to have repercussions throughout all the rest of the substance of which human beings are not aware. And those repercussions will come again into the world of which human beings are aware. <clears throat> and people are inclined to say, well, I didn't deserve this. I'm being mistreated. I want justice. Do you really? <laughs> well, you'll get it. <clears throat> the universal system, if we were to call it that, is a just system. It's absolute. No matter how human beings complain about their miseries, undeserved miseries. What is happening is not the way human beings have interpreted it. So there is a hopeless state here. As long as there is contention with the movement of life. Most people have no realization that they are contending with life. But the very endeavor to use life to one's own ends produces that result, one's own end. Many people say, my life is my own to do with as I please. Is it really? When did you make it? Life is universal. There is the necessity then of being restored to alignment with life. Now we have considered this in terms of the angel present incarnate in every human form and in terms of the archangel collectively. <clears throat> here is life in expression as it really is throughout the universe in expression at all levels of substance insofar as this spot in the universe is concerned restricted in expression by reason of the attitude of human beings who try to manipulate life to suit themselves, being ignorant of the fact that life has its own purpose. Contending with life is a futile undertaking. We find ourselves increasingly out on a limb. And eventually we saw the limb right off. <clears throat> because we become useless in human form. Not that the substance is useless. It's still valuable substance. It's still included in the total spectrum of substance. Even 
when the human body disintegrates, that is so, isn't it? The substance is useful. It'll be used again, one way or another, <clears throat> in the expression of life. But if we have diverted that substance to be used in the expression of something that is not true of life, and this is the human condition, then it must pass away. The human condition must pass away, not the substance. The substance remains. Our ability to function in this total spectrum of substance is based in what we have spoken of as the angel. The angel, the reason for the individual's existence. The whole reason for anyone's existence is in the angel, not in the earthly consciousness which assumes roles of various sorts in order to manipulate things to suit itself. So we have recognized the reality of the angel incarnate in human form. but imprisoned by the earthly consciousness of that human form, which assumes that it is something all on its own. It discovers eventually that that isn't true, but doesn't do the human consciousness much good at that point. There is a heavenly state of consciousness available to fill the earthly state of consciousness, as we recognize. And it is through the vibratory levels of substance, heavenly substance, that the earthly substance is rightly controlled. So it is only on the basis of the heavenly state of consciousness, the things begin to come under control again from the standpoint of the visible substance of which human beings are most keenly aware. <clears throat> that substance is not controlled creatively by manipulating it. Because I say that sets in motion all sorts of forces and other levels of substance which come back and clobber whatever it was that human beings were trying to do. I'm sure you've had that experience. Your intentions were so good. You were so careful in what you did. But look what happened. It wasn't my fault. Somebody else was to blame over there. So human beings blame each other, criticize each other, condemn each other, and work themselves into a frenzy of hate if that is done sufficiently until they start killing each other. As so though that is going to solve the problem. Well, the mind gets in there busily rationalizing and says, well, what would you do in this situation? I have to protect myself. Everybody has the attitude that they're the ones who are on the defensive. Everybody else is positively hostile. So, It is by reason of the angel and the heavenly state of consciousness which is present with us in this moment 
available to us in this moment. To the extent that we are willing to relinquish our ignorance and stop insisting that mentally speaking and emotionally speaking we are capable of handling what is essential in our own experience of existence. You think you can? Oh yes, you've been trained in this and in that, you're very capable. But that is a state of delusion. The heavenly state of angelic consciousness permits the use, the right use of substance. The right use of heavenly substance initially. heavenly substance of which earthly consciousness has been completely ignorant. The earthly consciousness says it doesn't exist. The earthly consciousness says, says to me now probably, I, I don't know what you're talking about. And of course not. How could it? Only where there is a beginning discernment from the standpoint of heavenly consciousness, it is said that spiritual things are spiritually discerned, not discerned by the intellect. Is there an awareness of levels of substance which are, in this sense, first substance? It is here that the true design is. And that true design needs to come through into the earthly substance. Because there is no earthly consciousness in its present sense blocking it. Blocking it by reason of its own arrogance. Now we are concerned <coughs> as angels with our true state of consciousness. And with a substance which moves easily under the influence of that true state of consciousness. And from level to level that movement is reflected until it includes all levels of substance. That is the restoration. That is the earth restored to its true state. Most people think of the true state as well, nice garden growing out here, trees and fruit and everything's lovely, and the lion is laying down with the lamb. Just as though it was just a little thin layer here on the surface of the planet. That's the view of earthly consciousness. Now, on this basis, human beings don't know what they're doing. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. They're ignorant. The great sin is a refusal to acknowledge ignorance and to be willing to let it go in favor of the wisdom that is already present. If one insists that ignorance is wisdom, then there's no space for wisdom. If this is the attitude that human beings have, they know so much, or think they do. And so we come again to the angels and collectively to the archangel, that there may be a flesh form which includes all the substance that is already present. Not merely this that we call physical substance,
but the total spectrum of substance. That is wholeness, holiness, making possible righteousness, the right use of all levels of substance, according to the true design of life. And what has this to do with the ridiculous affairs of human manipulation? Nothing whatsoever. It's a new state. Not the old state made over. A new state in which God is glorified because there is an awareness that the glory of God fills the temple of this solar entity, of this universe, and shines round about. O oh Lord, we are thankful for the opportunity of sharing increasingly in heavenly consciousness and consequently in awareness of the reality of universal substance thereby revealing the fact of oneness our good to be offered the opportunity of rising out of abysmal ignorance into a consciousness of the true wisdom which enables life to be expressed on earth as it really is, thereby revealing thy glory in the Christ. Oh, man. We're gathered here in this room, apparently a number of individuals. Is there really faith between you and your neighbor? Is there really faith vacant faith in this room? Or do you sense that the room is full of substance? Substance of which intellectually we have no awareness and can have no awareness. But of which we may have a consciousness to the extent that that is necessary to our angelic expression of life in the fulfillment of our creative responsibilities. We are not isolated entities. This fact is known in angelic consciousness.